now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We head back to March 23, 1951. Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore in the roles that they did in the movies, The Story of Dr. Kildare, March 23, 1951. The Story of Dr. Kildare. Whatsoever house I enter, there will I go for the benefit of the sick. Whatsoever things I see or hear concerning the life of men, I will keep silence thereon, counting such things to be held as sacred trust. I will exercise my art solely for the cure. The story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Metro Goldwyn Mayer brought you those famous motion pictures. Now this exciting, heartwarming series is heard on radio. Now, the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Oh, (laughs) Diana, come in, come in. Jimmy, I I know you've been busy, but that Mrs. Morton is still waiting. Mrs. Morton? Oh, the lady with the baby. Yes, I told her your schedule was full, but she insisted. Mm. Well, I guess I'd better go see her then. I can't imagine why she wouldn't settle for one of the pediatricians. Has the baby been a patient here before? No, I've checked the records. I was just going off duty, Jimmy, but if you need me... Oh, no, no, thanks, dear. If it was anything serious, she wouldn't have waited this long. All right, Jimmy. Bye. Bye. Uh, Mrs. Morton? Dr. Kildare, the, the nurse said that you were terribly busy, but but I just had to oh, see you. I, I'm sorry oh, to bother you, Dr. Oh, 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 Kildare. Now, take it easy. Oh, I'm sorry. You you don't remember me, do you? Remember you? Well, you, you look vaguely familiar, but I... Well, I, I, I wasn't Mrs. Morton the last time you saw me. Oh. Do you remember Kathy Winslow? Kathy Winslow? Well, of of course I remember, but well, you were only a little girl, and now you've got a baby of your own. I'm 19 now, Doctor. Oh, that's pretty old, isn't it? You say it like it was 90. <laughs> well, how are your folks? They're gone, Doctor. An automobile accident three years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know, Kathy. Well, uh, did you come to see me about, uh, about the little fellow sleeping in the blanket there? It is a boy, isn't it? Yes. He... He's only a month old. Mm -hmm. Mm. He looks healthy enough. What seems to be wrong with him? Dr. Kildare, I... I want... I want you to... uh, Kathy, what's the matter? Kathy, uh, get hold of yourself. I'm sorry. Dr. Kildare, could you... Could you find a home for him? You mean you want to give your child out for adoption? Yes. I see. Hmm. Uh, How does your husband feel about this? Oh, Dr. Kildare, I... I... Kathy, now I've known you since you were a baby. Why, your mother used to pay me a nickel to push your carriage when I got home from school. There isn't anything you can't tell me. Oh, my husband... My husband doesn't even know about the baby. Oh, I see. Kathy, do you know what adoption means? Yes. You know, once you give him up, I'll be bound never to tell who has him, and you'll never see him again. (laughs) Is that what you want, Kathy? Yes. Yes. That's what I want. Ah, look at him, Jimmy. Little rascal's trying to raise his head. What kind of a woman can his mother be? Do you want to walk out on him? Well, Dr. Gillespie, she's only 19. 
little more than a child herself. Ah, if she's old enough to have a baby, she's old enough to keep it and take care of it. Is she married? She uh, says her name is Mrs. Morton. Uh, do you believe her? I don't know. She was a sweet child, though. Came from a wonderful family. Well, that isn't always a guarantee against trouble, Jimmy. I know. What time do you expect her to get here? She's due any minute. Told her to come back this morning at about 11. Diana will let us know when she arrives. Uh, mm. uh, when you see her, please try to be kind, will you? Jimmy, you can't be kind to everybody. This baby could use a little kindness, too. I know. I only meant... I know what you meant, Jimmy. I know. We're doctors. Other people in the world may throw stones, but we're supposed to stand by and heal the bruises. If we can. Something tells me Kathy's bruises go very deep. Then you haven't changed your mind, Kathy. No. Is it because you're afraid you can't support the baby? No. If that's it, Kathy, we can help you get a job. Find a day nursery to take care of the child while you're working. And then after work, he'd be yours. You wouldn't have to face years of lying awake at night, wondering where he is and how he's growing up. I can't do it. I'd be no good to him. He'd grow up hating me. Kathy, there's nothing more valuable to a child than his mother. You must know that. But, but I don't know anything about babies. I do things all wrong, and, and lots of times he cries. He cries? Uh, what do you expect him to do, laugh? He's a stranger facing a strange world, and he has to learn how things are, just as you have to learn how to take care of him. You know, Kathy, being a mother isn't accomplished by giving birth. That's only the beginning. The baby will give you a chance, Kathy. Why not do the same for him? Oh, but I am giving him a chance. I, I want him to be somebody. Somebody strong and worthwhile. You seem to be under the impression that young babies crawl out into the world and succeed by themselves. Oh, but I'm not leaving him by himself. I'm asking you to find somebody to take care of him. Somebody... Somebody who's better than I am. Who are you trying to make things better for? Him or yourself? Oh, please. Please don't say anything else to me. If you won't help me, I'll... I'll take him to some other place where they will. I only came here because Dr. Kildare... Because... I... Because we've known each other a long time? Well, I was hoping you'd give that more thought. Kathy, remember the little girl you were? The tiny thing I pushed around in the baby carriage? You know, your mother wouldn't have given you up for the world. Or the sun or the stars. <laughs> if she were living, I wonder how she'd feel... knowing that you were giving your child, her grandchild... into the hands of strangers. Oh, please. <laughs> All right, Kathy. The adoption will be arranged. Parker! Parker! Did you call me, Dr. Gillespie? Did I call you, Parker? Why, no. Where did you ever get the idea I called you? Where is that confidential file I asked you to get? I gave it to Dr. Kildare like you told me. Well, then, why didn't you say so? Oh, I guess the cat got my tongue. Oh, yeah. Or maybe you were just shouting so loud you didn't hear me. Parker, I do not shout. You do, too. I should know better than try to argue with an old battle axe. Old? Now, let me tell you something, Dr. Gillespie. You, you're not exactly a rover boy yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. If you need me again, I'll be in the next room. Just fire a cannon and I'll hear it. Dr. Gillespie, what were you sticking your tongue out for? Huh? Oh, 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 yeah. I, I, I was just going to see the letter. Oh? Uh -huh. Slipped out of my hands. Must have... Gone under the desk. Oh, I'll help you find it. No, 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 no. It's going to wait. Yeah, I'll get it later. Have you looked through that file? Oh, yes, yes. Some pretty wonderful couples who haven't been blessed with children of their own. Jimmy, I know a hundred who'd be happy to take that Morton baby and love it and cherish it for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, Dr. Gillespie. I hate to be responsible for a decision of this kind. You don't think I enjoy it, do you? Mm. 
You know, Kathy wants that baby herself. No matter how she acts or what she says, she still wants him. I think so, too, Jimmy. Yeah. But what can we do if she won't keep him? There must be a reason for it. The uh, girl has a guilt complex, feeling of inferiority. Yeah, but why? Jimmy, she calls herself Mrs. Morton. But we've no proof that there is a Mr. Morton. No, that's right. Well, I'm going to try to find him. I'm going to check the other hospitals, locate the baby's birth certificate, and see if I can't establish the father's full name. Well, suppose you don't find anything. Well, then I thought perhaps we might let Kathy meet the couple who come to adopt the child. Once she knew he was going, her instinct might make her grab onto him. Oh, that's not very fair, Jimmy. Not fair to the couple who want the child. No. No, it isn't. Now, we can't do that. But... It might work if we got a couple to pretend they were thinking of adoption. Mm, that's an idea. <laughs> Especially if we get a couple she wouldn't want the child to be with. Jimmy, I know just the fair. Who? Oh. You leave it to me. You, you just get going and check on that birth. Uh, all right. I'm on my way. <laughs> Parker! Oh, Parker! Yes, Dr. Gillespie. Uh, sit down, Parker. Sit down. Well, what are you looking at me like that for? Parker, I have wonderful news for you. Parker, you are about to become a mother. We return to the story of Dr. Kildare in just a moment. March 23rd, 1951, the story of Dr. Kildare on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of the story of Dr. Kildare, March 23rd, 1951. Now we continue with the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Are you crazy, Dr. Gillespie? I couldn't adopt a little baby. I'm only asking you to pretend you want to adopt him, Bart. Well, that shouldn't be so hard for you. After all, you walk around here in a uniform pretending to work. Well, I never... The baby's matter. mother has never seen you. Now, do you want to help, or do you want to see that child separated from its natural mother? Well, am I supposed to be adopting this baby all by myself? No, Barker, no. I, I got a make-believe husband all picked out for you. Who? I sent Diana for him. He'll be here in a minute. As a matter of fact, I think I hear him coming right... Hey, did you want to see me, Dr. Gillespie? Him, Dr. Gillespie? Quiet, Parker, quiet. What's all this about him? Who's him? Dr. Carew, him is you. <laughs> Sit down, Daddy. <laughs> I remember the name of Morton, Dr. Kildare. I'm sure the baby was born here. Mm, it must have been last month. Mm, then it'll be in this record book. Yeah. yeah, here we are. Morton, a boy born to Mrs. Kathy Morton on the 14th. Mm, that's the one. May I see that? Well, please? of course, Doctor. Help yourself. Mm. Father, Sergeant Walter Morton. 
Don't you have an address on him? No, apparently Mrs. Morton didn't give an address. Uh, Sergeant. Might be a policeman, Dr. Kildare. Yeah? Or a member of the armed forces. Well, I'll find out. Thanks very much. You're welcome, Doctor. Dr. Gillespie, this is preposterous. Absolutely preposterous. It's also absolutely necessary. Now, let's go over it again. Where are you from? Australia. And what do you do in Australia, Dr. Or rather, Mr. Carew? We raise kangaroos. Sheep. You raise sheep. All right, Dr. Gillespie. Sheep. Now, why do you want to adopt a little boy? So we'll have somebody to take care of the sheep Ah. without having to pay wages. Ah. Dr. Gillespie, that young woman will think I am a monster. That's exactly what we want to think. Hello? Dr. Gillespie? Oh, Jimmy, yeah, yeah. What you find out? Uh, Kathy has a husband, all right. His name is Sergeant Walter Morton. Have you been able to locate him? Yes, yes, but what makes me? Well, get out there and bring him back with you. I just stopped a call on the way. Uh, how's your plan working? <laughs> Jimmy, I have the greatest pair of prospective foster parents you ever looked eyes on. Who? Parker and Carew. Oh, no. <laughs> Jimmy, by the time you get Kathy's husband back here, she'll be softened up completely. I don't think a female ape would hand her child over to Parker and Carew. <laughs> Or keep the wheels turning, Dr. G. I'm off for Fort Bixby. That's Sergeant Morton coming in with his squad now. What sort of a man is he, Captain? There isn't a better or tougher top sergeant in the Marine Corps. And stand there at attention till you decide which foot is your left. Sergeant Morton. Yes, sir. At ease, Sergeant. This is Dr. Kildare. I'm giving you a three-day pass so you can leave the post with the doctor. Yes, sir. Take over, Dr. Kildare. Doc, what's this all about? Where am I supposed to go with you? To see your wife, Kathy, if you'd like. Kathy? Where is she? Is she all right, Doc? I've been looking all over for her for months. She's all right, Sergeant. Yeah, by the way, when did you see her last? Not since she walked out on me months ago. Look, you got to take me to her. I've been half crazy worrying about her. All right, Walter, I'll take you to her. But uh, she's changed. What do you mean, changed? You said she was all right. She is, but uh, there's another man in her life now. A pretty handsome young fellow. Another man? Who is he? Where is he? Leave me to him. I'll punch him right in the nose. Oh, I don't think you will. He's pretty strong. Strong? Uh, I'll show him who's strong. Just wait till I get my hands on him. Just wait until he gets his hands on you. Walter, still going to punch him in the nose? See, Doc, he is strong, isn't he? Hmm. Look at the grip he's got on my finger. Got a pretty good grip on your heart, too, hasn't he? But why didn't Kathy tell me? Why did she run away? I'm afraid only you can answer that. Uh, Did you have any sort of an argument or anything before she left? Well, there wasn't an argument exactly. I, I was home from the post. She cooked a big dinner. But it was kind of burnt. I see. Well, then what happened? Well, Kathy's dinners were always kind of burnt. I guess I said something about it. Mm. Uh, what did you say, Walter? I said she ought to get on the ball with her cooking and housekeeping. Mm-hmm. And then I said it was a good thing we didn't have a kid because she'd never learn how to take care of it. Mm-hmm. Well, that was real bright, Walter. Uh, tell me, was there something uh, special about that dinner? You said it was big. Well, yeah. She'd bake the cake even. Mm-hmm. But, Doc, it was an awful cake, honest. I don't care how awful it was. That dinner must have meant something to her, because I've got a hunch that was the day she found out she was going to have the baby. And she was making that dinner so she could tell you and celebrate. Oh, Doc, holy smokes. Oh, what a dope I am. You can say that again. You married an 18-year-old girl who adored you and looked up to you, and then you treated her like a boot camp recruit. 
But, Doc, I love Kathy. I was just trying to tell her... Yes, only you were telling her like a top sergeant, not a husband. You had her so frightened she couldn't do anything right. Pick up your son and come with me. Oh, Doc, you gonna fix it so I can talk to her? Yes, and you'd better do some thinking about how you should talk to a young bride. You know, she can learn to do anything any other young wife and mother can do, if you give her a chance. So you don't want those people to have your baby then? Why, no. No, they were terrible people. Well, you've got to give them to somebody if you won't take care of them yourself. I've told you a hundred times I can't take care of him. I don't know how to do anything. Mm -hmm. I can't cook. I I can't keep house. I can't even make make a bed right. Who said so? You were 16 years old when you lost your parents. What did you do up till then? I went to school. And after that, you went to work, didn't you? Yes. Uh, So you never kept a home until you were married, did you? No. Did you expect to learn all the things a woman does in a lifetime in the course of a few short months? I don't know. March 23rd, 1951, the story of Dr. Kildare. Thank you so much for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily? without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets. It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of the story of Dr. Kildare, March 23rd, 1951. Well, Kathy. Dr. Gillespie. You mean, hmm? Mrs. Morton didn't like the uh, uh, foster parents I found for her baby. Oh? Oh, that's too bad. Well, they they wouldn't love him and take care of him the way they should. Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, come in, man, please, man. Uh, did you find the husband? Ah, uh, yes. He's waiting in the next room with the baby, but we can't let her know that yet. No, 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 no. She's got to be willing to take the boy on her own, with or without her. I think she will. Mm. Kathy, uh, Kathy, I found somebody else to take your baby. Someone who's certain to love him and be kind to him. Can, can I see them and, and talk to them? No, I'm afraid that won't be possible. Oh, but... But, Dr. Gillespie, let me talk to those other people. I told you why I was able to do that, Kathy. Because they were from Australia. That's right. If they'd taken the baby, they'd have taken it far away to a different country where you couldn't have followed them trying to see the child. Oh, but it isn't fair. You're asking me to give my child to people I've never seen. Well, that won't make any difference. You won't be seeing the child again, either. He won't need you, Kathy. He'll be somebody else's baby when they take him out of here. Foster parents take a child because they want him, Kathy. Once he grabs a finger with that little fist, he'll make a home for himself. He'll not only belong to them, they'll belong to him. All you have to do is to sign the adoption papers, Kathy. It'll all be over then and you can go. Here, right there. Just write your name on the dotted line. Have you got a pen, Jimmy? Yes, yes. Here, Kathy. A child should have two parents anyhow. Unless fate decides otherwise. A father to teach him to play ball. And how to sock a bully in the nose if he gets in a scrap after school. And his mother to feed him and wash him. And take care of him when he has the measles and chicken pox mm. and the mumps. A mother's hands are wonderful things, oh, you know. Yes. 
A doctor can give medicine to a child with a fever, but it seems to work best when his mother's there to put a hand on his forehead or wet his lips. Well, just sign the papers, Kathy. It's a worry when a child gets ill, Kathy. Look at all the heartache you'll save. You'll never even know about it. Where's my baby? Where is he? Kathy, you can't see him again. He's you tell he... me where he is. I want him. Nobody's going to take him away from me. Nobody. He's just behind that door, Kathy, with a man who also wants him very much. I want my baby. My baby. I want my... Oh, Walter. Walter. Kathy. Oh, Kathy, honey. <laughs> Jimmy. I think we'd better take a little walk. Yeah, I know just the place, Dr. G. Down in the basement where we can burn these adoption papers. Well, Jimmy, a very sad day isn't so bad, but it has a happy ending. Mm. Kathy and Walter and the baby. I think it's going to work out fine. But, well, well, Jimmy, look. Hmm? The world's greatest pair of foster parents. <laughs> Very funny, Dr. Gillespie. I bid you good evening. And don't you ever get me mixed up in one of your crazy schemes again. Why, I won't be able to. Did you hear the news, Jimmy? Daddy Carew and Mama Parker uh, are going to get married and move to Australia, where they can raise little kangaroos. For your information, if I ever want to get married, I can find a better man than I'd ever find around this hospital. Parker, you'd marry a rhinoceros if one proposed to you. You? You horrible man. <laughs> I have nothing further to say to you. <laughs> Good night, Dr. Kildare. <laughs> Good oh. night, Parker. Good night, Dr. Groove. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can't have dinner with me, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, I, I, I have a sort of a date with Diana. Oh, I, oh well, all right, run along, then. run along. You might walk over to the nurse's quarters with me. Parker may have cooled off by the time we get there, and I know how you hate to eat alone. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, I do hate eating alone. And Parker recovers quickly. I well, we don't know, Jimmy. We better walk real slow. <laughs> You have just heard the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. This program was written by Joel Murcott and directed by Joe Bigelow. Original music was composed and conducted by Walter Schumann. Supporting cast included Virginia Gregg, Ted Osborne, Georgia Ellis, Jack Crucian, Isabel Jewell, and Vic Perrin. Dick Joy speaking. March 23, 1951, the story of Dr. Kildare on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt, your shoulder hurts, your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, here's an episode of the soap opera Claudia. This was originally broadcast March 23rd, 1948. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you, transcribed Monday through Friday, by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now... Claudia. Oh, 
David, that's very pretty. You're in very good voice today. It's the first song recital I've ever given in a filling station. <laughs> I never thought I'd spend so much time in one. I don't know why it's taking them so long just to change the oil in the car. If they don't hurry, we're never going to catch our farmer. David, why do we need a farmer? I thought you were going to be one. Darling, a farmer isn't something you're going to be. A farmer is something you have to be all along. Well, I don't see what's so hard about it. You don't, huh? Well, Mama and I always had a window box full of flowers. It's just the same thing, isn't it? Only a little bigger. Mm, just a little. Well, I'm a little bigger, too. And you're lots bigger. Did you ever try to milk a window box at 5 o'clock in the morning? It's hard to milk a cow? Is mm -hmm. that what you're trying to say? Can't be too hard, David, when you think of how many cows are milked every day. I mean, if it were so hard, I don't think so many people would know how to do it. They know how because they were born on farms. You and I weren't. Unless you want to count your window box. I do. And I'm sure our cows won't count window boxes. Can't you learn how? Read it in a book or that newspaper you've been carrying around with you for the last two days. Yes? You mean the rural New Yorker? That what it's called, the mm. rural New Yorker? Mm. You think it'd be called the rural Connecticut? -er? No, that pardon. doesn't sound right, does it? What do they call people from Connecticut? Connecticuters? No, I think it's Connecticut. Titians. Connecticut tisks. <laughs> no, they call them nutmeg Yankees. I oh, think. it can't be that simple. <laughs> this is the country. Things are supposed to be simple up here. Then what do they call people from Massachusetts? Uh, they call them Yankees, too. You see, it really isn't simple at all. <laughs> I said it was supposed to be simple. All you have to do is look through this newspaper, and you see it really isn't simple at all. Farming is one of the most complicated occupations in the world. Well, it's been going on for so long, you'd think they'd have found a way to make it easier by now. The easier it gets, the more complicated it gets. What was that? I think that's one of the troubles. This magazine is full of ways to make your beets grow bigger and your hens lay more eggs. But I guess unless you were born and brought up in a chicken coop, you can't begin to understand it. But you've been looking at it for two days. I think by now you'd know it well, by I heart. I haven't been trying to become a farmer by reading this newspaper. I've been reading the advertisements and trying to find one. Find one what? Find one farmer and his, and his wife. I'd like a couple. I never knew farmers advertised. There's a whole column of people who want farms. And that's what I've been looking at. People who want farms? Mm -hmm. David, I am not going to sell that farm just because you can't understand what you read in a newspaper. Oh, they don't want to buy farms. They want to work on them. Only I don't see anyone who might work on our place. What's wrong with our place? It's beautiful. It's a real salt box with extensions. Certainly. With a championship herd of jerseys grazing happily in our imagination. You mean a farmer won't come to work for us until we have a real farm? Until we do, we won't be able to afford one. Well, then we'll just have to do it all by ourselves. We've got to find somebody around here in Eastbrook who could come and work for us part-time. Hmm. After we get things started, I can learn how to milk the cows myself. At five o'clock in the morning? David, can't we get some cows that like to sleep late? There must be some. To read the rural New Yorker, you'd think they'd found everything else. Tomatoes that won't blight, chickens that lay 340 eggs a year, strawberries that grow as big as you and big as your fist, how you to overcome acid in the soil, how to get acid out of the soil if you haven't got it in the first place. But every good American cow still wakes up at 5 o'clock in the morning, even with daylight saving time. Then we certainly have to get a farmer. That's why we've made a date with Mr. Bell. I hope you'll be able to spare us one of his hands part-time. One of his hands? Mm -hmm. David, what are you saying? One of the people who works on his farm, they call them hands. Oh. We'd have him living at our house in the spare room with his wife to help you with the baby, and he'd be able to work for us part-time for Mr. Bell the rest of the time. A minute ago, there wasn't enough to keep one hand busy. Now we have to have four. I don't understand it. Where'd you get four? Well, two hands on the hand and two hands on the wife. That's four. Oh, that's our car. We must have the oil changed. And before I listen to any more of your arithmetic, let's go see Mr. Bell. What sort of a farmer is Mr. Bell? Well, to begin with, he's the only one near us. The only one who might do. And everybody in Eastbrook says that he's the best farmer in the county. His cattle win all the ribbons at the state fair. Oh. His squash is big as elephant's ears. Really? Mm-hmm. His corn grows eight feet high. <gasps> he raises artichokes and scallions and kohlrabi and green peppers and spinach, and carrots, and red peppers, and a few specialty vegetables like endive and mushrooms. What's kohlrabi, Mr. Bell? You've never had kohlrabi? Nope. Why, it's a cross between turnips and cabbage. Brings a very good price. 
I'll give you some next summer. I had no idea that Connecticut soil was so good for farming. I'd always thought of it mainly as a dairy country. There's no more fertile soil anywhere if you know how to treat it. And if you don't know, I suppose you'd better stick to dairying, huh? Mm-hmm, or raising turkeys. Oh, I don't want to raise anything I'd have to eat later. Then you'd better not become a farmer. Anything that can look at me in the eye, I don't want to eat later. Well, Mrs. Norton, that cuts out pigs and chickens and calves. And I guess it cuts out black-eyed peas, too. <laughs> uh, we wouldn't want them to look askance at Mrs. Norton from her plate. I guess maybe Mrs. Norton will someday be just like any farmer's wife and she'll eat anything if she's hungry enough. Well, Mr. Norton, you'll be happy to hear that my wife won't eat a chicken unless I can prove to her I bought it downtown. <laughs> and I think she lost her taste for veal completely since uh, a little misunderstanding we had uh, ten years ago. You see, David, it's just what I told you. Farmers aren't really different from people at all. A good farmer is just like a good businessman. The earth is a hard mistress, but if you use your head, you can make her give back to you as much as you put in. Now, uh, let's see what your problem is. Well, the cows wake up at five o'clock in the morning. (laughs) That's a very serious problem indeed. But I assure you it's a lot worse if they won't wake up at all. Well, my (laughs) wife means that we expect to buy a few cows and we'll need somebody to take care of them. I think I can solve that. Now, frankly, Mr. Norton, I've been eyeing that land you bought for a long time. Your place isn't too far from here, and I can arrange that one of our men can take care of your herd in addition to mine. I'm sure we can work out a satisfactory arrangement that will include that. Mm, That's fine. Then, of course, you'll want alfalfa. Al who? What? Are you kidding Mr. Bell said something about an owl somebody. Uh, Mr. Bell suggested, darling, that we will have to plant something like alfalfa for the cows to graze on in the summertime. Oh, I know. They eat all summer, and then in the winter they... What do farmers do in the winter, Mr. Bell? Well, I guess everyone who hasn't lived on a farm would like to know the answer to that one. And in a couple of years, I'll come around and ask you the question myself. (laughs) Can you really become a farmer in a couple of years, Mr. Mm, Bell? Depends on how hard you try. Now, you've got some good land there, Mr. Norton open enough to run my tractors on. I'll be glad to work it for you. Oh, uh, oh, wait a minute. Have you a silo there? What's a silo? No, we haven't got one. No. I didn't think you had. Old Tucker hasn't had cattle on that land in years. What's a silo? You can learn that at your leisure. You'll only need a temporary one to begin with. I'm raising more corn than I need here, and I'll sell it to you as part of the deal. You aren't leaving very much for us to do. How can we learn to be farmers this way, Mr. Bell? Uh, then I assume you'll want some garden crops. Probably some corn, and if I'm not mistaken, you have some apple trees at the foot of the hill. And walnut trees at the west... west... Walnuts, eh? Well, we can forget about those. Cost too much money to take care of them, and they don't bring enough unless you have a good-sized grove. Well, my wife isn't so far off when she says there isn't much left for us to take care of. Mm. Mr. Norton, the object is to accomplish this work as efficiently as possible. The cheapest way is to handle your place as part of mine. I can see you understand that. Uh, That's why you came to me. I'll handle your farm just the way I handle other fields I rent. Rented fields? We don't exactly think of our place as just a spare plot of ground, Mr. Uh, Mr. Norton, I don't like to hear you talk that way. The trouble with most farmers is that they're sentimental and try to do everything the way their great-granduncle did it. They don't like to hear their land being called truck garden land when they've always had tobacco on it. They don't like to hear it called good vegetable land if they've always used it for dairying. Yes, I know, but... I've made a success of farming, I think, because I've tried to be as cold-blooded about my farm as a businessman is about his factory. That's all a farm is, Mr. Norton, a factory without a roof. You look surprised, Mr. Norton. Didn't expect to find this kind of sense in the country, did you? But all we wanted was two cows, even one cow. Doesn't matter how big or how small your farm is, You've got to think of it in the same practical and level-headed way a businessman plans his operations. Uh, but, Mr. Bell, if we'd wanted to be merely practical and level-headed, we might have stayed in New York. I hope you're not going to turn out to be one of those people who think the country is just an excuse for incompetence and inefficiency. Oh, no, we didn't think of it that way, but... Excuse but... me, Mrs. Norton, I'd like to finish this train of thought. Sorry. Now, farming a small place like yours involves a duplication of effort and wasteful procedures. I'll work out the unit cost for your land and... And when I put it under cultivation, we'll work out our respective shares of the ultimate product. David, do you understand what Mr. Bell says? I think I do. He means that he wants to farm our land the way he wants to, and he'll give us a share of what he takes out of it, and we'll be living on it like a couple of squatters. David, is that what we wanted? I don't think it is. Mr. Bell, I I know you've been a farmer all your life, and... 
You know how to do these things much better than we do, but we'd really... Now, I'd like to continue my train of thought, Mrs. Norton. You have a very fine piece of property there, and I don't want to see it go to waste. But when you say I've been a farmer all my life, you're wrong. You haven't been? But I thought... I mean, my husband said that all good farmers have to be born farmers. If I were a born farmer, Mrs. Norton, this farm here might be the same run-down, old-fashioned, decrepit place it was when I took it over ten years ago. Ten years ago? Then you mean you're... You're really not from Connecticut at all? I should say not. I'm from New York. I used to run a factory that made electric motors. I had to move to the country, but I didn't leave my brains behind. Well, Mr. Bell, we may have left ours behind, but we really didn't mean to put our whole farm under cultivation quite this way. I'm afraid it's the only way in which I'd be willing financially to undertake it. Then you couldn't just share one man with us? Not without upsetting my own procedure. Well, then that settles it. I'm sorry we even disturbed you, Mr. Bell. David, I... I... But uh, I don't suppose you know of any couple who would live with us to help us out? I'm afraid I don't, Mr. Norton. I'm afraid I can't help you. David, listen to me, please. What is it, darling? David, I... Well, I think we are enough of a couple for any farm. (laughs) You mean for any farm without cows? Whether without cows... But, darling, if Mr. Bell wasn't born in Connecticut, I don't see why we have to have been born in Connecticut either. And come to think of it, I I won't mind getting up at 5 o'clock. Will you? 5 o'clock? Well, that's, that's very sweet of you, darling. But to begin with, we'll be getting our milk out of a nice glass bottle. Dum dee do do dum dee do 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 Here's a pleasant suggestion to recall in the midst of marketing. Look around and chances are you'll find a Coca-Cola cooler in your favorite food store. Then shift your bundles to the other arm, drop a nickel in the slot of that friendly cooler, and up will come a bottle of ice cold refreshment. You'll find, as so many women do, that things seem to go a lot smoother when you shop refreshed. Excuse me, Mr. King. What happened to those Nortons? Well, guess they hurried back to the city, Mr. Bell. Uh, mm, They looked a little disappointed to me. Mm, Can't understand why they should be. Well, guess they just wanted to do it themselves, didn't they? Living in a city, you get kind of tired not doing things for yourself, even things like your own laundry. Sometimes you send it to a Chinese laundry, and when you can't talk Chinese any better than David can, you have quite a time getting it back as David finds out tomorrow. Well, be seeing you, Mr. Bell. I'll be seeing you too, Mr. King. As I was saying, every day Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For ice-cold Coca-Cola makes any pause... The pause that refreshes. This broadcast of Claudia was supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. From March 23, 1948, Claudia on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We thank you for making us a part of your day. Would you please thank this radio station and support their advertisers? It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite radio station. Would you also, if you miss a day on this station... You don't have to miss a single show. It's not just disappearing into thin air. You can find them anytime at iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Amazon. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. That's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. And visit my webpage. You can find more there. You can hear the shows there as well. Uh, You can also learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. And you can contact me there with links to our social media as well. Classicradio.stream. That is classicradio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.